Okay. I love working with those kids each week. It is, it is a joy. It is a pleasure. Um, I, it, it takes me back a bit of all the silly things that we used to do as kids. And, and you could probably, even thinking through that, <clears throat> that thought process, think of all the silly games that you played, all the silly activities that you got into, um, you know, shenanigans, whatever you will, whatever you want to label it as, you can probably think back to, to that point in your life. And today, I, I was reminded of recess. Every time I, I, I hang out with these kids, I'm reminded of what it was like to be their age, uh, maybe a little bit older, and, and go to recess. And, and the games that we would come up with, and I, some of them I think, wow, we were really out to harm one another, weren't we? I mean, really, when you think about it, Red Rover, Red Rover, what an attempt just to clothesline a brother or sister. You know, uh, hide and go seek. Well, you hide, I might come find you. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, those games are great. I love them. They, they've, they've always been a blessing. Um, one of the games that, that we did whenever I was in California, whenever I was in college working with kids, uh, was a game called Sharks and Minnows. I don't know if people still play that game, but basically someone was it, and there was a shark, and they were calling out the minnows, and they would say, send someone with this red shirt, or, or you know, that kind of thing. It was a attempt to get them to cross a field and catch them before and, and then the you know they wouldn't be shark food they'd actually turn into sharks I'm not really sure how that works in the whole metamorphosis thing but in the child game world that just works out well and it's a, it's a joy it's a joy to see those kids play um, and, and we all want to revisit that we all want to feel like hey I'm a part of a game I'm a part of something that brings me happiness I'm a part of something that that has a winner and a loser and or, or at least a participation trophy and, and we want to be a part of that but today as we get into this text I'm going to warn you ahead of time that as we talk about the grace of God that is going to be made known through his word we're reminded that this is not a game it is joy it is peace, it is fulfillment and victory, but it simply isn't a game. And we're going to look at this parable about not sharks and minnows, but servants and minas. And I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Luke 19, the 19th chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 27. And if you're following along on our pew Bibles, if you need a Bible, they're in the pews and available for you, not only for here, but you can take one. If we could gift you God's Word, what a blessing gift that would be. And uh, we're willing to do so. But it's going to be on page 932 if you don't know where Luke 19 is. Uh, we're not going to shame anybody on that. Um, you know, we just want you to know and be able to follow along with us. But we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 27, and, and we're doing so as a part of our overall uh, hope. These, these last couple years, we have been taking the time to slowly, and I admit it, slowly and patiently, hopefully patiently, uh, go through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in a, in a chronological order. Not just going Matthew only, Luke only, Mark only, and then, and then getting where the timeline is. Like, where, how do these overlay one another as the four Gospel witnesses of the Lord? And, and, and what do they tell us about this Jesus that is certainly central to all that we do? There is no one like Jesus. But we're doing so with the hope to say, this is who Jesus actually was because the Bible is the absolute sufficient and best source for knowing about Jesus. Everything else is only going to give you a small snippet about this person figure in history. But this is going to tell you about what he was like, what he said, where he worked, how he worked. It's, it's going to tell us all of these things about his life. And it's doing so that, so that we would see that, as that song says, Lord, you're worthy of it all. You're, you're worthy of everything I could ever build my life on. You're, you're worthy of the songs that we sing. You're worthy. And, 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 and who you've shown yourself to be is not a trivial matter. It's not something to take lightly. It's not something to discount. It's not something to just put as, a, as something when it's convenient in our life. You're everything, and you change everything. So with that in mind, let's see the joy of the Lord, the grace of God made known through his word. Would you stand with me as we read Luke 19, verses 11 through 27? 
It will be on the screen behind me, but as always, like I said, I encourage you to follow along in your copy of the scripture. This is the word of the Lord. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Therefore, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then to return. He called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minus and told them, engage in business until I come back. But his subjects hated him. And they sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. At his return, having received the authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given money to so that he could find out how much they had made in business. The first came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. Well done, good servant, he told him. Because you have been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over ten towns. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you will be over five towns. And another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I've kept it safe in a cloth because I was afraid of you since you're a harsh man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you didn't sow. And he told him, I will condemn you by what you have said, you evil servant. If you knew I was a harsh man, collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why then didn't you put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But bring here these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. I told you, it's not what you thought it was going to be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I've asked that you prepare my heart this week so that I may share in a faithful, appropriate, obedient manner. But God, as my heart has always been to, to share your word when it comes to hard text, hard to hear text. Lord, I admit the tinge of cowardice that, that kind of arises to to be faithful to share what you have told us to share. But Lord, I want to be obedient. I want to serve well. And more importantly, God, this, these brothers and sisters of mine, they all deserve to be led well. They all deserve to hear the fullness of your word. So God, I pray you would grant us that grace, that patience, that understanding. And God, you would do that and supply this by opening our minds by your word, by touching and, and working in our hearts according to your spirit and your power. And God, that more than anything, while we would see the joy that is found, overwhelming joy in your grace, God, we would understand that you, your grace, your gifts, your purpose, they are not a game, but they are good. So, Lord, show us that today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, what's our goal today? Well, our goal to do today is to do what we do every single week. To be here, to, 
to make much of Jesus, to, to share about why he is so worthy, why he is worthy of our faith, why he is worthy of our following, why, why he is worthy of working towards uh, uh, fruitful endeavors, all of this. And, and the only way we can show that consistently, obediently, sufficiently, is by going to what God himself has said about who he is. And so to gain a greater understanding of this God, we go to his word and say, Lord, tell us what you say so that we can know all of it. And you may have heard a version of this parable before, but you may not have ever heard the whole parable. You may have never read all of it. And certainly there aren't words of Jesus that matter more than other words of Jesus. All of scripture, all of it is inspired. All of it is God-breathed. All of it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. All of it, all the messages, all of the, the history is, is for our encouragement, our example, our instruction. This is what the Word tells us. And that not one aspect of the Scripture ever came about by man's own desire, but men led by the Holy Spirit were recording these words. Even the words of Jesus. So we have to take a serious consideration who has given this to us and that he has given it to us for a purpose and that purpose is good. But we also sometimes read it and like I said, it may be the first time you've ever read this parable altogether. In fact, you may have only heard the other parable about the three servants and the talents where one had received uh, three, another had received two, and another had received one. And and the first one was faithful and multiplied it. And the second one was faithful and multiplied it. And the other one was not faithful and he hid it. But here Jesus tells a parable that's really close. But he's telling it at a different time. And he tells it in a different way. But it doesn't mean it's less important. And so we're going to see what it means among brothers and sisters. And among the saints who have been entrusted to, for the ages to preserve and to keep God's word. So that we do not go astray in wild doctrine and wild teachings or try to purport something that's not there. When we look at what God says and what it means, then we can begin saying, how do we rightly apply it today? While it is a story about other people that Jesus was telling, what is he telling us to do as a result of it? So we'll begin seeing how it rightly applies when we rightly understand what it says and what it means. But you've come to a worship gathering, and worship is always about the revelation, God making known who he is, and us responding, seeing what he has made known and responding to it. So when it comes to God's word, the revelation that's there is also an act of worship. When we respond and say, well, I trust what God is saying when he's telling me about himself, when he's telling me about myself, when he's telling us about our world, when he's telling us about sin, when he's telling us about righteousness, when he's telling us about salvation, when he's telling us about Christ, when he's telling us about instruction, what must be done, when he's telling us about what must not be done, will I trust God in what he's saying? And today we see in this parable a lesson. And that lesson is when we rightly respond to what we've been graciously given, when we rightly respond Believe it or not, the true joy of the Lord is the result. And I don't want you to get that mixed up. There are many people that will automatically assume when you speak of religion, when you speak of Christianity in particular, they automatically assume that there is absolutely no joy or good that can come other than charitable giving, charitable work, maybe a Sunday morning singing of pleasant songs, but there's really no other good and fruitfulness that comes from following Jesus. And that simply isn't so. And this parable highlights that. How does it do so? How does this parable, what does it tell us about a right response to the, to the Lord and the result of joy? Well, let's, let's dive into it. Let's take it apart, put it back together, see what's there, see what it says, what it means, how it applies, and let it lead us. First of all, it's a parable. A parable is a story that has a higher meaning. Um, in biblical terms, it's always been said, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But here, it's a, it's a story. It's a comparison. It's a metaphor. It, it's Jesus taking something that is lesser and able for us to grasp to highlight something greater. Now, I will tell you that in these parables, 
even though they're telling us something greater, whenever you read a parable, while sometimes it does point that there is a God figure in it, there is a fatherly figure, the son is sometimes known, not all parables automatically relate to that. Most of the time it's telling us this is an earthly story, and if it makes sense to this earthly, how much more so does our God, who is holy and perfect, act exceedingly abundantly above and beyond these means? But here in this parable, we see a little bit of its perspective. It has a setting. It, has, it is a moment why, why Jesus shared where it's there. And the Bible doesn't give us guessing games on this. It points us says, as they were listening to this, as they were listening to Zacchaeus and, and his response to the gospel, as they had just witnessed in days before a blind man named Bartimaeus and another blind man, these beggars that were in Jericho, received sight. As they had heard these parables about the vineyard workers and the abundant grace of a master who gives generously to all. As they had heard all these things and they know they're on the way to Jerusalem. They know they're on the way for the Passover. They know there's this building, budding up of, of what Jesus has been accomplishing in his life. And they think, this is the time. We're near Jerusalem. We've just seen all of this. This must be the days that the kingdom of God is going to appear right away. We're going to see the glorious fulfillment of it all. The amazing things that Joel and Amos and Malachi and, and, and Hosea and Isaiah and all those prophets spoke of. The, the things that all of these traditions have told us over the years. We're going to see it. They're on the trajectory towards Jerusalem. But one of the things that they had known about, but it may have selectively forgotten about was that while they were on the trajectory to Jerusalem they had been witnessing over and over and over again while multitudes had responded to the message of Jesus to in faith in Jesus there were still a large sum of people of important people who over and over again had rejected Jesus and so Jesus in talking about the kingdom He's going to address those things. That yes, he has all authority. But yes, there are those that will reject him. And Jesus is going to turn things topsy-turvy. He is going to Jerusalem, yes. But they don't yet understand, even though he has told them multiple times, he's going to endure the cross. But even that rejection and that trial and that death and that burial... Even it will be the very means towards the ends of God establishing his immense rule, his sufficient rule. And so the perspective on this parable is that there is a kingdom and it is established and Jesus is going to establish it. But Jesus is going to go away and return before that full day. And in the meantime, for the faithful servants... Faithful service is what's promoted in bringing true joy, in bringing reward, in being justly handled and observed and welcomed. So this parable has a perspective towards those ends. But the parable also highlights people. And so you look at this in the parable and it's people and you see a three different sets of crowds. You see there's a nobleman who is receiving the authority to become king. Jesus here is almost using the illustration of what had happened with Herod the Great, the king who had gone to Jerusalem and had been selected by Caesar Augustus to rule the, the, the people of Judea. Um, so he's ruler of a small kingdom in a greater empire. And then Herod the Great's son, Archelaus, went to seek the, the rule of the king because he had multiple brothers. He went to seek the rule from Caesar, and Caesar actually split the kingdom up and only made him a partial ruler. And a part of that was because there were letters that were sent and saying, we don't want this man to be king. And so it was split between him and his brother Antipater and Antipas and Agrippa. And Jesus uses this illustration to talk about this one king but he says there's a king, who, a sovereign leader, who will be entrusted. And then there's servants, ten of them in fact. 
And to each of them, he gives certain minus, certain sums of money. And then there's some other subjects that are mentioned. There's subjects that hated him. It doesn't say that all the servants did, but there are certain subjects in this nobleman's area that did not enjoy the authority that this nobleman had and the fact that he would be given greater authority, greater rule, it bothered them. They rejected him. And so the parable is telling us that we're going to fit in a certain place. Now, one of the places we're not going to fit is that we're not going to be the sovereign. We're not going to be the king. Not one of us is going to be that. You may have a very powerful position. You may be a person of importance. You may have immense wealth. You may have great means. But there's only one true king. But there are those that are different. Are you his servants who serve him willingly? Or are you his subjects that are under his authority, but yet you seem to constantly refuse and reject it? In one place is a right response to grace that's given. In the other is the missing out of joy, the result of it in our life. So we look at the parable and its people. But we also look at the parable and its premise. Jesus says that this, this story has action. This story has, has things that are moving parts. And said so after Jesus, after the, excuse me, the master, this nobleman, had uh, entrusted the sums of money, he goes and he receives the authority as king. And, and then he returns. He doesn't tell us when he returned, but he, he does return. And, and, and he doesn't tell us how long he's been gone, but he summons those servants that he had gifted money to so that he could find out how much they had made in business. Jesus says in this premise that we see something that's going to take place that we need to be reminded of. While you don't know the day or the hour, you don't know the time, and point blank, Jesus said in Acts to his own disciples, those that walked with him three and a half years, it's not for you to know. Because he knows us. We be procrastinators. I'm just going to put a little offshoot there. Just imagine if Jesus spelled out for us the exactly date, time, and um, hour when he was going to return. How many of us are going to be like, I'll see you three days before that? Because I'm a deadline beater. That's what I'm going to do. Jesus doesn't do this. He knows the frailty of our humanity. He doesn't leave us that. But he gives us the premise of what faithful service looks like. Why? Because there will be a return of the king. And on that day, he will summon his servants, just as he does in this parable. And on that day, he will hold them account. The premise is the king will return. The premise is the servants will stand before him. And the premise is he will see what they did with what he gifted them. And that parable is a reminder that for those who respond rightly to the Lord, the result of that return and standing before and with holding out what he trusts us with life, it will result in joy. But for those who refuse and do not respond rightly to the grace that's been given to them, the result is not joy. There's a fourth aspect, and that's the parable and its privilege. Think about this. In verses 13 and then 16 through 19, it says he he, he called ten of his servants and and he gave them ten minus. So ten servants and he gave them ten minus each. And, and, And with the instruction, I'm giving these to you, but I'm giving them with expectation. Like, it's yours, but... It's, it's a gift to be put to use. It's a gift to be fruitful. It's a gift to carry on what needs to be done. And it says when he returned, he was expecting to see what they had done, specifically with those minas. By the way, if you're trying to figure it out, a mina, because we don't usually operate in minas today, but a Greek mina, terminology from the Bible, was about equivalent to a hundred days wages, a close close modern day U.S. equivalent would be about $4,350 per person. So 10 servants means 43500 approximately. But that sum is not really the part that matters. Even though the, the gift is there, he gives them instructions. He says, engage in business until I come back. Notice what he gives in those words. He gave all 10 instructions. He did not withhold from them what he expected of them. He gave them an understanding. This is what I'm holding you responsible for. 
But he also not only gave them the responsibility and the instructions, he gave them all provisions. He's like, he didn't say, I, I want you to engage in business till I get back. I want you to do my instructions, but I'm not giving you any means to accomplish this. No, he says, I'm giving you the very means. I'm not withholding that from you. I'm giving you the actual means. I'm giving you the actual provisions to do that. And he gave all 10 servants that, all 10. But in that statement, engage in business till I come back, there's also admonition. You know I'm coming back, right? I will be back. I want you to understand that. You may not know the day or the hour, and it's okay that you don't know the day or the hour. It's okay if you don't know the how it's going to happen. It's okay if you don't know the what will happen. It's okay if you don't know the where will happen. But it's very important. You know who will make it happen. You know this. It's an admonition. And so the privilege is for those who rightly responded. The first servant comes and he says, your minor master. He is reminded that even though it was gifted to him, it still really technically belonged to the master. It's yours. And it says that he's earned you 10 more. I had one, now we have 11. And the master commends him. Well done, good servant. And not only does he commend him, he rewards him. He says, you've been faithful in a very small matter. Now I'm going to entrust you in something greater. Yes, now you had $4,350 or some odd equivalent. 100 days wages. And I entrust you with that. Now I'm going to entrust you to be the leader over 10 cities. What an incredible, immense, hundredfold reward and entrusting that is for such a responsibility. But it is more responsibility. But he gets, receives it out of joy. The second servant, he's faithful and he's fruitful. Whereas the first servant was faithful and fruitful and received tenfold, he's faithful and fruitful and he, and he re receives fivefold. But he's still commended. He's still rewarded. He's still entrusted. He, he does not remove of that. You see in these men an interest in the word of their master. That they understood it was a privilege and rightly responded to him would bring about joy and result. One of the early church fathers from the uh, second century says this, interest on the word of God is having in life and deeds things that the word of God has commanded. They, they understand that Having an invested interest in it is, is going to result in the, the effects of it in our life. And that result will be a privilege. And so the, the, the parable is presenting these so that we would see when we recite, we respond to what's been graciously given. And we're reminded we have been graciously given. The true joy of the Lord is the result. There's a fifth aspect and that's the parable and its problem. This is the part where people get stick home. This is the part that gets rough that we don't like seeing. And that's the difficulty of this sinner. He's an unfaithful servant. He is an unfruitful servant. And among those, he gives a sham accounting, according to Matthew Henry. I love that, a sham accounting. I feel bad because I, I like that terminology, but I'm wondering how many times I've given a sham accounting in my life. But you see in him the faithless understanding of the king himself. He says, Master, using the right term, here is your mina, understanding it was hit, the, the Master's all along. But I've kept it safe in a, in a cloth. Why? Here's the problem. I was afraid of you. Now, there is a healthy level of fear of God. I understand that. But I was afraid of you because of this. You're a harsh man. You're an, an accounting man. You're an exacting man. You're a very black and white man an absolute man and I was afraid of you then he goes on to cast aspersions you collect what you didn't deposit now wait a minute collect what I didn't deposit I gave you the money and you reap what you didn't sow I sowed that into your life to bring about the reaping this is the accusation. This is why this is sham accounting. 
And this is why Jesus, in this parable, tells of this master saying, I will then condemn you by what you have said, you evil servant. You have a faithless understanding of me. I'm the king who has been enthroned. I am the king who has not withheld means from you. I am the king who has not withheld instruction from you. I am the king who has not withheld admonition from you. I am the king who has been witnessed to have supplied rewards to those who are faithful, who has shared generously, who continues to entrust. And this is how you understand me. This is your sham accounting. You have a disillusionment because of your sinfulness. And I'm going to hold you account based on your words. Based on his own words, you see the overflow of this servant's or lack of serving own heart. He believes the king to be an exacting man. And yet in his disillusionment about what his sinfulness was doing, he said, I'm afraid of you because you're an exacting man. And yet by his own words, there was no exertion. There was no effort on his part. Knowing that he's an exacting man as he called him. There's no effort on his part knowing he would be held accountable. And yes, you may say, well, yeah, he, he just had a bad view of the king. He just didn't know him. According to this parable, a mistaken view is no excuse. Let us understand that. A mistaken view is no excuse. And rather than seeing the gifts as gracious and as bringing about his good, he viewed this man, this master, as hard, as unjust. And what he states with his own words, that even though he was entrusted by the king himself, he is like the rest of the subjects who do not desire the king's dominion and who will ultimately refuse the king's rule. And so we see this difficulty for this sinner. We see the disillusionment for this sinfulness. But we also see in it a definition of sin, which I think John Piper's words when he was explaining what the definition of sin was, and this is just a short person of that message, he said this, what is sin? If you were to try to define it, sin is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the promises of God not believed, the commandments of God not believed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. He says, why is it that people can become emotionally and morally indignant over uh, poverty or exploitation or prejudice or abortion or the infractions of religious liberty or the manifold injustices of man against man and yet they feel very little or no remorse or indignation or outrage that God has been disregarded, disbelieved, disobeyed, dishonored and thus belittled by millions and millions of people in the world and the answer is this, sin. It is the ultimate outrage of the universe. This is the problem in the parable that is making very prominent position about what took place in this person's life. Why? Because the Lord in his love seeks to address the problem before it is far too late. And we see him, him doing this, that when we rightly respond, we're reminded of his gracious gifts. When we rightly respond to those That's where true joy is the result. But when we disobediently, when we without faith respond, when we, rather than being faithful, seek and live a life that is faithless, rather than being fruitful, we don't produce anything. Then why would we expect joy to be the result? And why would we expect the joy to be blessed in other means that are against the gracious good of God? There's the problem. And in this moment, the parable giver presents the master's pronouncement. In verses 25 through 27, it says, But he said to him, after he said, Take away this mina and give it to the one who has ten. But they said, But master, 
He has 10 minus. And the master says, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given and the one who does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. Here's the situation. Those who reject the rule of Christ, their situation is dire. It's dire. It's not just a little bit difficult. It's not just a little bit negative. It's not just a little bit flawed. It is dire. The consequences could not be greater. Today in this room, if you are someone who has rejected the rule of Christ, who who does not yet follow him and has not followed him in submission and faith, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus as, as Lord and Savior, the consequences for you and the reason that you're here is to be reminded that that situation is dire and yet you're here because the Lord did not desire for you to remain in that dire situation. That's why you're brought before messages as harsh as they may be. It is because God's grace is being communicated because you still have life and breath in you and His grace is being extended to you. But know this, the offer of forgiveness does not last forever. As one Puritan writer says, yes, there is such a thing as late repentance in life. But there is such a thing as the rarity of such repentance. Understand this. This situation is here. The standard is that all Christians, all servants of the Lord, they have business to do for Christ in this world. We have not been entrusted to be idle. And those called to business for Christ, know this, you're not left alone. You're actually furnished by Christ himself. The Bible tells us he has given us everything for life and godliness. He did not lift you to fend for yourself. But also understand this, all Christians will be called to give great accounting. And it will be a great accounting because we will stand before the king. He will not shove it off to some angelic bureaucrat. We will stand before his throne. He will speak to us directly, not in a general sense of people, but one-on-one. And we'll be accounted for what gains have been brought about for the glory of God because of the grace of God. We'll be held accounted for how the gospel that was given to us, how it was demonstrated from us. And the question will be, will we be accounted as faithful? Will we be accounted as fruitful? Will the evidence of the gracious good of God that has been so gifted to us be evident by the right response in our life? Will that be there? Because the one response that results in joy is one that says, Lord, you're worthy of my service. You're worthy of my honor. You're worthy of my labors. You're worthy of my life, my breath, my means, my family, my work, whatever it takes, my love life, my lack thereof, whatever it is, you're worthy of it all. And I give that to you. Your say matters in all of it. And to refuse is to say, I choose to live a life outside of the bounds of God's joy, which is greater joy than any fruitless promise that the world could ever give. And Jesus says, for those that rightly respond, the master gives us that example That even what they have will be added to. Why is that? Because they have been shown an industry rule. That those who have shown and proven themselves to be faithful in little. Have shown themselves worthy to be faithful in much. And those who have shown themselves to be unfaithful in even a little. How could they dare to ask for more? This is that example. Jesus is not punishing the poor. In this, me- this part of the message, I've seen that used and spun around in various tweets and posts and whatever you call them now. And see, even Jesus will take away from those who don't have. That's not what is being said. That's taking a verse out of context. He's saying those that were seen as unfaithful, they, even what they think they possess, that it will be removed. And ultimately, the end... Jesus gives an example of what they had been witnessing all throughout their lives. 
when it came to the pilots of the world, the Herods of the world, the Archelaus's of the world, the Antipas's of the world. And that was anyone who dared challenge the authority of the king and were slaughtered on the spot because they were saying with their lives, I would rather die outside of your rule than live under it. And Jesus says, these masters on earth have given people exactly what they've asked for. They would rather die outside of their rule than live under it. Now, he doesn't say what they did was right. But he was giving them an understanding of that's how it is viewed. And he says, if that is how an unjust, perverse, twisted world rules... How much more so when we think about the pronouncement of the king of kings that stands before us. Will we choose to be those that live in faith and life under his rule? Or we would seek to say, we don't want your authority. We don't want your commissions. We don't want your instructions. We don't want your provisions. We'd rather hide those away. We don't want your admonition. In fact, we could care less about knowing when you return. We don't want that. Well, the Bible is quick to say that while God is just and the eternal punishment that awaits those that do not submit to him is is a real thing, it's also really receiving what you've asked for all along, even though you don't know what you ask for. But let's be reminded that the grace of God is far more marvelous than that. Yes, there will be a day that we'll all be held to account. And if we have not submitted to the Lord Jesus, we have not trusted him in faith, then we will die and perish under the wrath of God, the justice of God. But I want to remind you that it's not too late. And then even with all the strange and and outworldly things that we do, outlandish things we do, how heinous things we do, And for those who come to Jesus, there is forgiveness. It's not too late. I want you to think upon this, that you may see this as a very harsh statement from the Bible, but I want you to remind you, the same one that's telling that parable is the same one as he is being nailed brutally to a cross after being beaten over a period of hours, who is exhausted, who is hungry, who is tired, who is facing death at the hands of enemies. His words were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is the one we can come to. Who, While we live and have breath, it is not too late. The parable is a reminder of that right response to the gracious gift and offering of God. And in doing so is the beginning and a lifetime of true joy in the Lord. I pray that you know that joy. I pray that you have come to Christ and know what it is for him as Lord, Savior, King, Sovereign. And I pray that you wholeheartedly know the joy of being his servant. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time today. I know it was a lengthy message. I know it was a hard message. But I know it comes from your good word. It comes from filled with grace extended to us who are so desperately in need of it. Thank you, Lord, that even though we are great sinners in need of a great Christ, we have a great Christ for our need of sin. Now, Jesus, I pray that you would have your way in us as we respond to you in this moment, that we would receive your good, we would understand your grace, And Lord, our desire would be for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.